Okay, guys, um, class begins. All right, so uh, welcome to the second lecture of Digital Circuits. All right, so now class really begins. Okay, so welcome to the second, second week. Um, of digital circuits. As you might uh, already observe, I'm not Professor Mutlu nor Chapkun, um, but I am here to present this lecture on uh, FPGA boards and how you're going to program basic circuits um, for the labs. Uh, my name is Der Yuan, and I am a doctor student in Surgeon Chapkun's group. So the slides that we're going to use today are adapted from your first textbook and also slides by Professor Mutlu, uh, Professor Chapkun, Dr. Skirkenak, and uh, Dr. Anjan Raganathan. So um, first off, let's talk about some administrative uh, thingies. Here are the lab sessions, and I believe all, most if not all of you already received an email from me telling you that essentially everybody gets to be assigned to their preferred first preferred lab slots uh, for each week. The lab sessions, just to reiterate again, are going to be held on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Fridays from 8 to 10, and Fridays from 10 to 12. Primarily, these lab sessions are going to be held in rooms E26.1 and E26.3, all in the main building. Okay? Now, on Tuesdays, there are much more of you um, who signed up, but we have enough rooms, so eventually we opened up E19 uh, for you to work in. So eventually, if you don't find um, enough spaces here and there, you're free to go there, and there's going to be assistance there as well for you. At other time slots, we might have some empty spaces for you to work with, so there is enough seating for you to hop around occasionally if your schedule for a certain week does not fit your allotted time. Okay, so um, other than that, assignments aside, in terms of the labs, as an overview, there are going to be nine labs in total, 25 points, as you were informed of last week. These 25 points would be 25 points out of this 100 points you would earn throughout this semester, okay? So we're going to put the lab manuals online every week before the lab starts for you to work on, uh, start working on it at home if you want to. And um, essentially, during the labs, what you have to do is just to follow these lab instructions and uh, perform them step by step, and you should be fine. Other than that, uh, in terms of the grading, at the end of these lab manuals, you will find a sort of a report, at least some questions formatted into a report uh, type uh, layout. And these, cons these reports consist of certain questions that you should be able to answer or you would try to find the answer to, uh, to, to solve certain challenges. And in certain, there's an important thing to note this semester or this year is that there's no need to hand in the reports this time. Uh, the reports are optional for you to figure out the, question, uh, the solutions, and we're going to release the official reference solutions for you later in the semester as well for each of the labs. Okay? However, in each of these reports and as well the instruction, in lab instructions, whenever there is a mention of you of, that requires you to talk to the assistant or have an assistant check your work or circuits, please do so so that they can mark your corresponding grade on our internal sheet. Um, the grades will also be made available to you um, by request later on, okay? So um, this is the important thing. The assistants need to check your work, and uh, they need to mark it down in their internal sheet. You should finish the labs within one week after they're announced. So, for example, lab one starts next week, and this means that after the next week, um, the lab, at the same lab session, that should be your deadline for finishing lab one. All right. um, we understand that sometimes there might be difficulties with some softwares or certain people may not be able to show up for certain times or weeks. Um, we can make exceptions. That's not a problem at all. Just please inform us beforehand. Um, you can inform me personally or um, the assistants during the labs. So here's the goal. All right. We want you to earn, we want you to walk away from the lab sessions learning as much as you can and essentially what I want is for you to earn all of the points. That, that is our goal as assistants. So please do feel free to talk to us whenever you have questions. If you can't solve certain problems, please feel free. It is in no way an exam where you're just given the grade at the very end, okay? We try to make it as interactive as we can. All right, so um, if there are certain issues uh, with the labs, please also let us know so we can immediately fix them for other day students. 
by the end of this lecture, you might find that you are so, some of you might find that you are so interested in this course, you've done so well, and you've had a great time that you would like to participate in the future. And uh, we definitely encourage this. So if you are really interested in the end, um, feel free to email the lecturers next year to volunteer to become a, uh, an assistant for the course. Well, actually, volunteer is the wrong word. We do pay assistance on an hourly basis. So um, actually, we also realized that um, approximately half of the assistants we have for the labs are students who had taken the course um, in previous years, and they are invaluable resources that can really offer you um, really up-to-date experiences on how to implement these circuits and complete your tasks. Okay. So um, other than that, if there are any individual questions, please approach me during the break so I can sort them out for you. It's definitely not a problem. Um, but are there any sort of high-level overview questions you would like to ask? Anybody? OK, then I think we're all good. Uh, there's so, much of you that, so many of you that I have to scan for a bit. All right, so um, that's the lab issues aside. Now, today's lecture. What are we going to learn this today's, in today's lecture? Well, today, and as well the lectures for tomorrow and the two coming weeks are going to be uh, telling you about the basics of circuit design. So these are the fundamental things that should bootstrap you to prepare um, to implement real-world circuits on our board. So today we're going to talk about programming logic devices, what they are. We'll use uh, throughout the semester an FPGA, um, and you need to know what it is, what it's composed of, how, how it actually works, and how it differs from real-world circuits. Um, you're going to know how it works, um, and I will also reveal to you some of the details of the FPGA board, some of the features you can use later on for your own interest. Uh, for, this, for the labs in this year, we will also use a development software to implement the circuits. So basically, that would be your portal where you write um, the FPGA code and have them um, synthesized and implemented on the real-world circuits. And at the end, near the end of the lecture, I will give a short tutorial on how you can do that. The software is called Vivado, by the way. So finally, I will also go through the individual labs. We have nine labs in total. These individual labs I will introduce to you and uh, tell you what you should expect, okay? All right, so let's begin with the first thing, um, programmable logic arrays. So first of all, there are a lot of t types of logic arrays that can be used for digital circuit design. We list two types here. Um, the first one is the really basic one. It's called a programmable logic array. So these programmable logic arrays are simply uh, an array or a block of many AND gates concatenate combined with, um, follow, which, is, which is followed by a block of many OR gates. So these really are the basic building blocks that you can use to compose any Boolean logic circuit. Okay? Remember in the first lecture, Professor Mutlu mentioned that uh, uh, using examples from train stations and such, the basic building block in a computer architecture um, can be really low level, like transistors, um, or even really high level, like uh, software components. And we're somewhere in, on the hardware side, and these basic building blocks right now are these combinational circuits, which are end gates, OR gates, and other um, basic circuits. So these program, programmable logic arrays, or PLAs, allow you to implement combinational logic only. And we'll get to that a bit later. So they're composed of fixed internal connections. So basically what a programmer or circuit designer has to do is to specify which of these connections to activate so that certain results from AND gates of inputs can be connected later on together in the OR gate. Okay, so these are just Boolean logic. Um, more details will follow in the coming lectures. All right, so these are rather limited, and um, what we're going to be working with this semester are FPGAs, Field Programmable Gate Arrays. Now, FPGAs are somewhat more complicated. They do not compose of a simple uh, concatenation with, between an AND gate array and an OR gate array. What we do here in FPGAs is that each FPGA contains of multiple configurable logic blocks, or CLBs. And it is in these logic blocks that uh, you can indicate in detail specific functions um, of how you would like your output to be based on the given input. Okay, so it doesn't have to be restricted to just being represented by AND gates and OR gates. It's actually really general. 
It performs lo combinational and logic, uh, as combinational and sequential logic. Sequential logic is more as a, is 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 more powerful in combinational logic because it, it considers um, basically the result of sequential logic consists of um, inputs that you give to the circuit, but also inputs that you give to the to, you gave to the circuit previously. So combinational logic essentially um, is, um, for example, one plus one equals two. So one plus one, it is always two, and therefore there is no need to store whatever has, has happened before. However, um, an example which, in which you would use sequential logic would be, let's say, counters. If you want to count the number of students in this classroom, you need to have a memory of how much you have counted. For example, if I have already counted until here, I would be counting, I'd say, maybe uh, 80 students. And if I have to increment by looking at the next student, I would have to have memory of this number 80. So sequential circuits allow, uh, allow you to uh, store what you have learned in the past, past inputs, and use them later on in the future. Okay? And this is what FPGAs give you. Um, the difference between combinational logic circuits you will, you sh would be uh, more thoroughly introduced in future lectures, starting from tomorrow. There are also um, pro programmable internal connections between, within FPGAs, and basically more complicated stuff you will see later on, too. So FPGAs, uh, in more detail, composed, are composed of these uh, control configurable logic blocks we mentioned, and uh, they perform the primary logic. However, to interface between uh, this logic and your external input and output, we need this input and output buffers, which act really as the gateway to map your circuit to input uh, from, from outside, like a switch or a button. And also, the output of the logic should be linked to your to the output, such as maybe an LED, um, a USB uh, device, storage, or maybe a display, or something like that, okay? So there are also the programmable, programmable uh, interconnections that are within FPGAs essentially connects the CLBs and IOBs together so that they form the complete implementation consisting of input and output, and also the corresponding logic underneath. Some FPGAs do include other building blocks to make your design more efficient, such as uh, memory and uh, multi multipliers. And as a matter of fact, the board that we're going to be using this semester, they do contain multipliers. I believe it's pretty, and because uh, multipliers are essentially more complicated to implement, that's why they sort of pre-built it in there for you, to so that it can be synthesized when your circuit needs them. Okay, um, here's the typical FPGA schematic. The schematic essentially consists of uh, multiple CLBs, these configurable logic blocks, and at the very out exterior, you have these IOBs that connect whatever logic you have to your outputs, your buttons, switches, and lights. Okay, any questions here? Okay, um, I guess maybe some of you are already curious as to how CLBs are implemented, so if you want to deep uh, dig a little bit deeper into how CLBs are implemented. Let's have a look here. So CLBs, they're, they comp they're composed of essentially lookup tables. So remember previously in these PLAs, programmable logic arrays, we have uh, the, essentially two primary components, right? An AND gate and then an OR gate, that, and then later they are composed together. Um, these, are these, are, they would, these would somehow resemble the uh, sum of products, that you would later on see in the lecture. <clears throat> With CLBs and FPGAs, what we offer here are essentially a really general model of describing a circuit. Namely, lookup tables are used, and these are essentially truth tables. So you can really define any function that, are, that might be much different than end gates and uh, OR gates. Okay? So whatever you define as a truth table, uh, you can modify it, you can, you can specify it in these truth tables, and the output would be according to whatever you like to design. So it doesn't have to, res to be restricted to um, the concatenation or the or of a bunch of ants. Now, later on, uh, CLBs would also consist of flip-flops. So flip-flops are actually... Uh, registers, and they allow you to keep state, okay? So they allow you to keep, um, uh, store whatever result you have computed in the past, 
um, such as the counter example we had before, the, the current number of students we have counted so far. So at the very end of this CLB, there is a multiplexer. This is the symbol of a multiplexer. Um, note that these squares, these are not the symbols of LUTs or FFs. Okay, so they're really not that specific. But this is the symbol of a multiplexer. So a multiplexer allows you to multiplex between two inputs. Um, more specifically, they, are, they allow you to specify which of these two inputs are you going to accept and send as the output. So think of it as a selector. You can select between um, the output of the LUT or the output of the flip-flop. Right? The interconnections between the LUTs and the flip-flops essentially allows, and additionally, uh, the results from the, of, the LUT, of the LUT to be stored in these flip-flops. So they can be, later be used for future computation. The flip-flops, given that they have memory, you will later realize that they would need a clock signal to uh, progress to the next um, state. And they would also require a reset signal in case you need to reset the contents of this flip-flop back to zero. All right, so have a look at this and let me know what you think. Okay, um, any questions here, confusion? Okay, we're still good. All right, you're keeping up. Good. So, um, now that we know how these CLBs are, what they're composed of, and knowing that we have a lot of them, we're, we are ready to look at the overall design phase. So, really, right now, I'm jumping for, to a higher level to see how you should design an FPGA, okay? So, what you should keep in mind is that these CLBs are resources on the FPGA, and therefore, we wanna, these are precious resources because oftentimes you might end up designing a really complicated circuit and you would need a lot of CLBs. Now, a good designer, a good circuit designer would know to design a more simplified circuit such that it consumes less of these CLBs and therefore um, you can fit much more functionality into an FPGA. And this is what later you will look at in a, one certain lab later on. You will evaluate the, uh, the performance of your circuit based on how many CLBs or lookup tables, essentially, that your circuit would take up. So let's go over this design flaw, uh, flow. So the design flow currently essentially goes like this. Use a CAD tool um, like Vivado or any other software to design and implement a digital system. Now, it is in these uh, design tools that you are able to um, implement or describe your hardware, describe your circuits, and uh, you can synthesize them, and you can debug them using simulation, okay? So um, one of the labs later on, I believe it's lab six, you will also use simulation to validate the correctness of your circuit. So essentially what you do here is you, you enter your design um, using a schematic entry or an HDL. So this is really uh, abstract here. A schematic essentially, um, back in the days, a lot of CAD tools, they allow users to actually draw circuits in the computer, on the software, so that it can later be automatically synthesized into a circuit. Another way would be to use a hardware description language, such as Verilog, which is what we're going to use in the semester. So that is essentially writing code, like C code. Um, but please note that it is not C code, um, uh, and a lot, of, uh, what, a lot of the things you've learned in the past about certain constructs in C code, they do not necessarily apply here, even if they use the same syntax but we get to that a bit later. So um, schematic entry, you will also learn um, to appreciate uh, how one should comprehend and implement circuits in the first lab, and you will also learn to understand, to, to, you will also learn that it's a pretty complicated process and you wouldn't want to draw circuits for every one of your designs. Okay, so um, correct functionality can be verified using simulation, and later on, after you designed your circuit using schematic entry or um, writing code, you can use the synthesis tool contained within Vivado to, imp to map your description onto the FPGA, okay? And the result, is, uh, concretely speaking, is a bit file. So it's essentially, uh, essentially this binary file that you would take, and you would program this, essentially program the board with this binary file, okay? So the binary file is downloaded to the FPGA, and therefore you can see how it works. All right, any questions on this flow? Okay. Oh, yes, please. 
Oh, an HDL is a hardware, stands for Hardware Description Language. Um, primarily, these are essentially these programming language you use to describe uh, the circuit. And I will use one example later. I know of two primary types of HDL. One is called VHDL, and the other is called Verilog. And they all start with V, but they're different, uh, different languages. <laughs> okay, so think of it right now as just code that you write. All good? Great. So feel free to ask questions whenever you need to or want to. All right. So this is the board. And later we're gonna, I'm going to show you a small tutorial on how you can program it. And uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the experience. So the FPGA, the FPGA board that we're going to use is a new board called the Basis 3. And each group would get one board that you're supposed to take care of in this semester. So really try not to lose it because otherwise it cost some money, okay? All right, <laughs> so the board contains a lot, of, a lot of things that you can play with. So, namely the following. Now, it's a lot, but we're going to break it down like this, okay? So the first of all, what you're concerned with should be um, the switches here. Remember when I talked about inputs in the IOB, in the input-output buffer of an FPGA? So these are the inputs that you're going to be looking at. Immediately, see, you immediately see here that these are 16 switches. Basically, it's each switch will represent the input of a zero or a one. And then you have these LEDs, okay? These LEDs are the outputs, or at least some of the outputs, that is supported by this board. At the heart of this board, you see the FPGA chip, and this is the, ch this is the, uh, the, the chip where inside it contains a lot of um, these uh, CLBs, and uh, they're in LUTs and all of the other cool abbreviations. So um, this is where you program your logic to. And you can see other input and outputs. For example, you see this four seven-segment displays over here. And essentially, these allow you to show uh, numbers or alphabets or, um, as later on seen in the labs, you can see you can do make up whatever animations you'd like with these uh, displays. Also, there are these buttons here. So uh, from the constellation that they used here, it would appear that you can maybe implement like a small video game. I don't know. All right, so um, going up to the top, there's a video output, a VGA output, and you can easily specify um, certain pins to, to, you can connect it to a monitor and specify um, whatever output you want to send to this monitor in terms of RGB values. So it's pretty cool, and um, you can actually try it out with some demo um, projects that are available on the resource websites of this board. The USB port here allows you to connect like a mouse, a uh, keyboard, to take further input. Okay, and that's maybe a bit more complicated, and that's outside of the scope of this course. But uh, again, feel free. You have an entire semester to use this board. Here you have the power switch, and you have the micro USB. The micro USB this year is used both for powering the device, so basically connect this, this, uh, this board to your computer, uh, be it your laptop or the computers in the lab, and it's going to be powered by that. And also, it's going to be the interface where you program it. Okay. So you just need one cable to program and power the device. Remember that when you want to power it, uh, when you want to program it, be sure to flip the power switch on. Okay, so uh, hopefully this will not be one of the questions you ask the assistants this year. Yeah, I'm trying to save them some trouble as well. Anyway, um, there are other switches and uh, these pins around here we can adjust <clears throat> for essentially, uh, for example, how boards should be powered. Should they be powered by USB or should they be powered by an external power supply you give them? And here, there are some switches where you can say, well, I want my board not to be programmed by USB, but by some other JTAG interface, whatever. And there's a small button here to reset the software. And these are just small things that uh, you can play around with later on. OK, any questions on any other parts of this board? All good? All right, so um, essentially that is it for this board. And um, later on, I'll show you a live demo. Okay, <clears throat> so by the end of this semester, what we would like you to do is to implement your very own processor. Remember that 
uh, in the previous lectures, we, we kept talking about these building blocks, one leading up to the next, right? One more, a, a simple one leading up to a more complicated one. So what we're going to do here is use simple logic circuits, like these AND gates, OR gates, NAND gates, NOT gates, whatever gates you have. And later on, at the end of the semester, we're going to build a processor that you will use. And it's going to be, um, hopefully, Turing complete, so you can run any program that you want. Each week we'll have a new exercise. Not all exercise, exercises would require the board, so you don't have to carry it around with you all the time. I'll try to indicate this on the labs, okay? You're also encouraged to experiment with the board on your own. As I mentioned, there are tons of uh, I.O. ports there. And clearly you can see also here, you have other I.O.s you can attach. These four uh, connectors here, they, they, you can actually connect multiple things over there, like uh, your extra LEDs, um, yes, extra inputs, and uh, I don't know, some other displays of any sort, right? You can also maybe connect the board, these boards together so you can have inner board connections and communication. So this was left, uh, this, this was copied from last year's slides. It says, it is not possible to destroy the boards by programming. And I would still like to believe that it holds true for this new board that we have this year. Uh, <laughs> so do your worst. Um, really try to play with the board a lot um, and do what you can. As a side anecdote, a few years back, people used to use these FPGA boards to build Bitcoin miners. Anybody heard of Bitcoins? All right, so you're all, you all like money. Um, <laughs> so they used to use FPGAs to build uh, miners. Of course, nowadays, they are uh, obsolete, and they're replaced with these special build hardwares called ASICs. Um, but uh, feel free. If you can find an implementation to mine Bitcoins, and uh, you can do that using the board that we give you for this semester. Knock yourself out. Okay, so um, I'd like to quickly go over the labs. And at the end of, the, of introducing you to the labs, we can maybe take a short break. And after that, I'll give you a tutorial on the software. Okay? And feel free to ask any questions about the things here. So for lab one, um, lab one is actually really basic. Um, we are not going to ask you to use any of the software or the boards um, and in, in the sense that you don't require these software boards to complete lab one. In lab one, we simply want you to use your, use your pen and just draw a comparator circuit. So we'll just, we, you just wanna, we just want you to start drawing circuits and appreciate how, how you know, wires can be connected together and how they can really be fun. So lab one, using an example as a comparator, we want you to compare two inputs and essentially output one if they are the same. So if two inputs are both zero, then you would output one. Yes, I heard somebody say it, I hope. All right, so if, if uh, the two inputs are zero and one, then you would should output zero because they are not the same, for example. All right, no FPGA programming, but you can definitely try out the boards. We're gonna give you the boards next week and you can already try them out based and try to maybe replicate whatever we did together today on the tutorial, okay? And maybe you can also try to implement this comparator circuit. All right, in lab two, you will use the boards. In lab two, you will design a full adder and a four-bit adder, okay? And these are just first examples of um, the combinational circuits that I mentioned before, namely these circuits that do not keep state and yet out, and output results immediately, all right? Like, the, like, for example, one plus one equals two. So you want to design first a full adder, essentially taking two bits and outputting their sum and carry, okay? So the sum is maybe one plus one is, would be zero, right? And the carry would be one because you carry it off to the next uh, digit. And then later on, you will learn to instantiate or built on top of this full adder module, and you're gonna construct a four-bit adder, right? So this is an important, uh, important technique in Verilog, or in circuit design in general. You wanna build small modules, and then later you instantiate these modules multiple times in your circuit whenever you need them, all right? So everything has a nice hierarchy here, and you can um, debug certain independent modules, and your entire um, processor at the end of the semester essentially consists of instantiations of these different modules, okay? You're gonna use the FPGA boards and the inputs, you can use the switches and the output would be the LEDs. So you simply light LEDs up 
according to the binary computation result that you did. So hopefully, I hope you have all gone through the reading assignment parts on binary numbers. Any of you? No? Okay. Uh, it'd be best to go over it because, well, this lab needs it. And also, maybe this would be important for the exam. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. So remember in lab two, uh, we were just outputting these computations in terms of binary on the LEDs. Now in lab three, we want you to map it to a seven segment display. Essentially, if the result is uh, eight, for example, you should show eight. And if the result is uh, 11, for, or 12, for example, you should show C. And if the result is um, 16, you should show F. So just simple stuff here. As an optional uh, challenge, you can also uh, convert these hexadecimal representation of numbers to decimal, all right? So this is essentially what we want you to do, to show you that, hey, in addition to LEDs, there's much more out there on the FPGA board you can explore. Okay, in lab four, we're gonna do something a bit more fun. We're gonna implement a sequential circuit. So this is your first lab on sequential circuits. Um, you will learn to implement a blinking, L uh, sorry, a set of blinking LEDs for a car's turn signals. All right, so it's going to be this Ford Thunderbird uh, car back in the days where um, the lights would blink one after the other when you want to indicate left. There's a, there are three light, lights going on, like one, two, three, blinking slowly right after the other. Right? So they're much more fun than the indicators we get nowadays on our cars. Okay, so this would be where you would learn how to first design a finite state machine and be able to differentiate between uh, um, two types of finite state machines, and later on, mapping these finite state machines design to your circuits and have them running. Okay? In lab five, um, actually by the end of lab four, you're training um, as a, you know, amateurish uh, circuit designer is complete, and starting from lab five, we're going to build towards that NIPS processor we've been talking about in the beginning of the semester. All right, so lab five is first, what we're gonna do is we're gonna build, um, I would say maybe the, the core. The core would be an arithmetic and logic unit. Basically, it is an important part of the CPU that does computation on binary uh, input, such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, and comparison, and basically any other things you've used in the past, all right? And also logic um, operations like and or not, so that's why it's called an arithmetic and logic unit. Now understand that later on, um, you will realize that a MIPS processor consists of not just this core ALU, but also consists of like uh, control units to tell um, other parts of the computer to activate, for example, write access to a memory or to enable taking inputs from an external uh, input that is mapped also uh, by a memory address. That also come, that always comes uh, a bit later. So lab five, you're supposed to do this. And also, you would synthesize the circuit. And this is where you can look at how, uh, how your design performs uh, in terms of the space usage. You will use the synthesize uh, tool, and you will see how many lookup tables or how many uh, CLBs you use in your design. Of course, the less, the better, okay? Because the less there is, uh, the less you use in the, in the circuits, the more uh, space you have to design more complicated circuits at your will later on. Right? But don't worry, the, 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 the FPGA should have sufficient uh, story, uh, number of LUTs for any of your designs. Okay? You'd surprise me if uh, you managed to exceed it. All right. Now, the problem here is we're going to be implementing a 32-bit ALU, which means that it's going to take in 32 inputs. Right? per uh, 32 bits per input. But if you remember, when I show you the board, we only have 16 inputs, right? 16 switches, maybe five more buttons. So naturally, it is not so feasible to verify, to test whether or not your circuit works um, using the board. And that is why in lab six, we are gonna ask you to simulate your ALU design using simulation and verify it using a test bench, okay? We're gonna teach you about this later on as well. So you're gonna validate that your ALU is functionally correct in software. And this is an important part in a lot of design processes um, that allows people to efficiently and quickly identify um, problems in their design and fix them accordingly. 
So, uh, after lab six, you should have a properly working ALU. And lab seven, we're going to jump a bit far, uh, a bit higher on the, on the abstraction level and have you start writing assembly code. So, these are the assembly code that you would later use to run on your very own MIPS processor. Um, so, it is important that you write correct code here as well. We want you to uh, calculate, for example, sums, uh, the sum of number ranges and perform some basic image manipulation. So these are the assembly code that you would write. Um, you would just write an assembly, and later on we'll use a tool to convert this assembly to binary code. And it is these binary code that you would later send to the processor that you built, um, and the processor should be able to parse these codes and perform the corresponding instructions. Okay? Now, given that we're going to be implementing a really basic um, processor, it is important to know that uh, we only support, I think, seven instructions for now. And, it is in, this, and in this lab, these are the only seven um, instructions you can use. Okay? Now, by the way, in this lab, we don't use the board. We use the sim uh, an assembly simulator. So there's no need to bring the board. All right. So in lab eight, you're going to know how um, a uh, processor is finally built together. Basically, it's, it consists of connecting uh, your ALU with a control unit. And oftentimes, in, in, a, in a computer, you also need some memory, and you also need some input and output. So you're going to put them all together, and all of this will be done in the hardware description language we talked about before. Okay? And you're going to complete your first design. This is really basic. And you're going to run a test snake program. This program is yet another assembly program we'll, we will provide you with. And you can send this uh, program to your design to see if your MIPS processor can correctly process these instructions. What you should see, uh, more specifically, should be this. So just a basic snake animation. OK? Uh, Maybe as a bonus, um, we can add in future labs, or for those interested, you can th use those buttons that I mentioned, which look like uh, directional arrows, to, uh, to control the snake's direction. I mean, it's, you know, this is in no reference to the latest uh, phones that Nokia released. Um, all right, so lab nine. In lab nine, you will learn to improve the performance of your MIPS processor um, by adding some new instructions. In addition to the snake program, there are also other programs that you use, like, for example, summing numbers, where you might not just use summation, but you might also use uh, other instructions, such as multiplication, um, based on whatever ways you come up with to calculate numbers and process them. So right now, we would like here, uh, sorry, in this lab, we would like you to implement multiplication functions in your MIPS processor, and then also bit shifting, OK? Bit shifting is a technique that allows you to quickly or efficiently um, multiply numbers by two or divide them by two. Okay? All right, so these are all of the labs. And essentially, by the end, we would like you to um, have uh, a MIPS process running, be proud of your design, and have it work. <laughs> okay? Any questions here? All right. Good. So, um, also as a side um, uh, challenge for Lab 9, we would also ask you to implement um, a variation of the snake program. Um, you would be asked to add more switches to your, to your code um, to support different speed modes of the snake, so it could move at a much faster pace than that video I showed you. All right, so, it's just on the side. Okay, so... Um, now that we've covered the labs, let's talk a little bit about um, how we can make this all come true. So, Vivado. Vivado, as I mentioned before, is the software you use to program these FPGA boards. You get to design these circuits using hardware description languages. As I mentioned before, these are the two languages that uh, are the most famous right now. And Verilog is the one that we use in this course. It looks very much like C, but then again, that's only for your benefit. But, uh, for example, please do not interpret four statements in Verilog as actual four statements in, uh, in C. Essentially, if you write four statements, for example, in Verilog, 
you are not really going through instructions, the same instruction over and over again. You're actually instantiating multiple instances of a particular hardware. So that may be one of the examples you can refer to later on to, to identify the difference. The Vivado software allows you later on to synthesize your circuit after you've written up the code. And the synthesis actually generates a netlist, or a, think of it as a premature design that con contains um, how the logic should be and how uh, they should interact with an, uh, input and output buffers. Through the implementation process, you would generate a, the, the binary file that actually links these individual input and output buffers to their respective ports, like the individual switches. Um, on the board and individual LEDs. So there's a part in this designing process that you not only have to write, uh, where, you don't, where you not only have to write the logic circuit of, of your design, but also Im indicate which input and output should correspond to which switch or lights or output or input uh, there is on the board. Okay? And then finally, with the bit file that's generated, you would program it. So there's just a click. And then, and then you get to see whether or not your circuit is correct or not. This is all things done with the FPGA board. With simulation, as mentioned before, you just do a test benches. You don't really have to program the board. You just do test benches. And there you can verify not only whether or not um, your circuit is functionally correct, but also whether or not it satisfies uh, um, certain time constraints. Like uh, if you want your circuit to finish within 20 nanoseconds, would, that actually be, uh, would, uh, would your current implementation actually satisfy this, uh, this uh, requirement? All right, so um, typical design process here, just to reiterate again, you create a project, um, you implement your circuit, you set the constraint file to, to specify which I.O. device to use, you implement it, generate the bit file, which is called the bit stream in Vivado, and you program it to the board, or later known as the target, okay? So you'll want to connect your board at this time and power it on before you click that button. Okay, so any questions here? Okay, cool. Um, just uh, out of curiosity, who of you took the labs last year? Can you raise your hands? Okay, great. Uh, so identify your colleagues who are raising their hands. There will be your also people you can ask if questions later on. Um, anyway, if there are no questions, let's take a quick break, and we can resume later, and I'll give you a short tutorial. Okay? Thanks. Everything all right? Oh, this is so cool. Okay, guys, um, class back in session. Can everybody hear me? Okay. All right, good. So, um, as I mentioned before, in this uh, second part, we're going to go over a quick tutorial, and together we will design our very first circuit. Um, just mind, just as a reminder for all of you again, uh, typical design process for the FPGA in our labs consists of the following. You start Vivado, create a project, um, add program sources um, to create your own circuit, implement it using some um, hardware language, which is Verilog. And this is similar to, you know, um, when you're programming in C, you add a C source file, a header file, and such. And then later you use the constraint file to specify, uh, to tie your input and outputs of your circuit um, to the actual input and output devices on the board. And finally, you implement your circuit you generate the bitstream and you program, you send this bitstream to the board, all right? So uh, before we begin, I have some things I'd like to announce. So, so one, of your, one of your peers approached me in the break asking about these uh, boards for uh, those who are really interested. So we do have, I believe, enough boards for all of you um, in terms of groups, and we have some some spare ones, um, we should have some spare ones afterwards. So please write me, um, let's say, at the end of next week to, to ask me again, and um, I can give them to you if you want to play with, uh, if certain uh, students would like to play with it, with one of their own during the free time. And uh, this lesson doesn't have to be restricted just a semester. You can maybe borrow it for a longer time if you'd like. Um, another question was on the boards. Um, one of the questions I got before was, um, when this bit file is programmed to the FPGA, um, how is this somehow configuration stored? How is it somehow stored, right? So it's stored because 
um, the controller on the FPGA board knows which parts, um, knows how to configure its LUTs so that they reflect your desired circuits. And uh, this means that when the, and also when the power is turned off, um, this configuration is lost, okay? So it's somehow non-persistent memory. Um, yeah, so if you power it off, you'd have to reprogram it, short, shortly speaking. Another issue was the software of Vivado. You can also install Vivado on your own computers. Um, the latest versions, I believe, is 2016.4, and uh, you should be able to install it without problems. Although, if there are any issues, please do come by the lab sessions, and our assistants would help you to complete the process. But uh, basically, the free license available on Xilinx um, alone would be sufficient for you to finish all of the labs this semester. We're not using a lot of complicated uh, functions they provide this year. Yes? I Oh, you mean the Vivado installation file? I think it is pretty huge. It's like, I don't know, 100 of megabytes, even up to oh, one yeah. gigabyte? Yeah. So it's, it's pretty huge. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, the moment we've all been waiting for, the unboxing. So uh, this will be the FPGA boards you get. Um, actually, it will not come like this. Uh, you're going to have to fold the, the, these cardboards, the boxes, by yourself this year because you guys are the first years and you're going to be touching your boards for the very first time. Uh, using it, sorry. Um, okay, so. Uh, this, is the, this is the board you're going to be using. And uh, this is the USB cable you will use to connect the board to the computer. All right, so fresh new board. We open it up. Uh, some phones here and there, but voila, this is your board. Okay, so it's much uh, smaller than previous years, uh, more e much easier to carry around. And uh, this is actually, is that essentially exactly as shown in the uh, photo I just showed, you, showed to you before. Okay, so what I'm going to do is connect it to the computer and power it on. All right, so new board, so let's be careful with this. All right, turn it on, and there's going to be this demo program running by default. And essentially, it counts from, um, I think, zero all the way up to nine, and then just loops, all right? If you uh, turn, switch on some of the switches here, you will see the corresponding LED right on top of it to light up. This is just the demo program, okay? So this is not what we want just yet. So let's go back to this design process. Um, I'm going to use a running example here uh, for this Okay, try to ignore that for this example, uh, for this tutorial, and it's going to be the AND gate. The output is true, essentially. The AND gate is essentially does the following. It outputs one if both inputs are one. Wait, you've all heard of AND gates, right? Show of hands. Okay, good, great, great. It's the best example. Um, okay, so we're going to do that with Vivado. We're going to implement an AND gate, and what I want in the end is to have this. I'm going to have two switches here. One representing A, the other representing B. And one of the outputs, an LED here, and it's going to show light up uh, one when both are turned on because that's what AND functions are for. Okay? So uh, let's quickly look at this Vivado software. I've started it up here already, but otherwise you can find it in the start menu. So let's create a new project. I believe it should be here, and I need to duplicate the screen. Now we have it, I believe. Okay, so we create a new project. And this leads you to wizard. And you click next. And I can specify the project name. So any names come to mind? What's oh, that? Somebody said? And demo. And demo, okay. It's really creative. And demo. Um, so it's an AND demo, and everything else can somewhat remain the same. The project location, there's a, there might be some issues if you place the project on, your, on the desktop in the machines in the labs. I tried it. It's kind of weird. So if you want, you can maybe uh, store it somewhere else, like your flash drive or uh, on drive D or C, and then later copy it or make a backup of it. Okay. All right, so we create a new project like this. It's going to be an RTL project. Okay, a registered transition level project. 
Um, I'm going to close this again. And next. Now, this is where we can add sources, but we're going to do everything from scratch this time. So, let's not add anything, anything here. Add existing IP, also ignore this. We're really just using the really basic functions here. And also, and then you click next, adding constraints. Again, we're going to program our own constraints later, so ignore this part. And next. Now, this is where you specify to Vivado which board you are using. So, um, there are obviously a lot of boards down here, okay? And uh, I'm going to tell you exactly what to type here. Essentially, what you're looking for is this uh, basis 3 board. And what you want to type in here is XC7A35TCPG236.1. And then you get one match. Um, it's not really magic. I just looked up all the specs. Um, and uh, basically, every board has different uh, things that the software needs to adjust to. All of this will also be uh, available in the lab manuals, by the way, so hopefully it'll be complete. Okay, so after selecting this, you click Next, and now you can create a new project. There are a lot of warnings here saying that you essentially have nothing as an empty project, but uh, this is what we want to start with anyways. So, finish. And you will see here, in a minute, this um, design environment. Okay, so in this design environment, first I want to point your attention to um, the left part. You have this flow navigator, and essentially you see pretty much the flow that I mentioned to you before, right? You have uh, the project manager that allows you to add sources to write in your code. Um, IP integrator, we're not going to do anything about that, so ignore that for now. Simulation, because typically you want to simulate this before you synthesize, implement, and, 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 uh, and uh, program it to the board. So... Let's skip simulation for now because you do that in lab six. And then later on, there is going to remove that. I don't know why it keeps popping up. Sorry. Okay. So, and then here you see synthesis, implementation, and finally the program part, programming it to the board. So, what we do here first, I want to add, start, start designing this very lock uh, implementation of the end gate. Okay, so what I want to do here is click Add Sources. And here again, you have different types of new sources that you can add or create. So just the design kind of sources this time. The design sources are essentially the Verilog files. And by adding, it actually means that uh, you would have already a source and you would, on, you would want to add it, add, a given, uh, add an existing source. But we don't, so we want to create a new file. So end demo. So I would maybe go with end demo. Um, camel case, uh, but feel free. So click OK, and then now you have this nDemo.v. The extension V is very long, essentially. So you click Finish, and now there, there's going to be another uh, pop-up window showing up asking you to define the module. Now, oftentimes, um, experienced designer, they want to go through this process so they can quickly develop or type in what kind of inputs uh, and output uh, their module would take and, uh, and give. Um, but we are really starting from scratch here, so we don't have to type it in here again. Okay? Well, we want you to um, type in the codes by yourself because later on these would be important for you to memorize um, and also helps you prepare for uh, potential exam questions. Okay? So you click OK. By adding nothing here, it asks me if I'm sure. Definitely. OK. And now we have the source. So you see here the new design source. Uh, I feel like I have to do something about that. Oop. All right. So this design source, if double click on it, um, on the right part, this would be where you type right in your code. Okay. Now the syntax um, of Verilog and its grammar will be taught in later lectures. So, but given that. Um, we're just implementing a basic AND circuit. It should be easy for you guys to understand what I'm trying to type here. So module AND demo, uh, it takes in two inputs, right? A and B, and outputs X, OK? So what I'm going to do, do here is write input A, input B, and output X. And that's it, OK? This means that this module has these three IOs. So 
uh, and you end this, the description of this module with end module. So this is simply the declaration, followed by a semicolon, and this is just the syntax for very log. Right? Um, the typical uh, habit here, a good, a good uh, rule of thumb, is to only have one module uh, for one, uh, one source file. Namely, uh, if you have two modules, it'd be good if you separate it into two source files. Right? This is just good practice for uh, modular design. So here what we want to do is simple. We want to have x um, be 1 whenever uh, a and b are both 1. So the end function, you would assign x to a and b. Right? So that's how it is. It's pretty simple. Okay. Uh, any questions here? <laughs> no. Good. All right. Um, of course, naturally, throughout the semester, you're going to come up with your own very complicated versions of uh, designing simple circuits. And a lot of times, they do make sense. And maybe later, you will also learn another way of implementing um, this AND function here that might be um, that might make sense. Uh, if you draw it in schematics. Right now, we're really just saying that, hey, behavior, behavior, uh, in terms of behavior, X should be uh, A and B. Okay? We're just indicating the behavior. All right, now that we're done with this, um, it is time to indicate, again, set the constraints. Right? We have to say, well, the A should be mapped to, let's say, this switch, and the B should be mapped to this switch over here. These are the inputs. And let's say X would be mapped to one of the LEDs over here, all right, on the top. Uh, the, the Hangout thing is used to set up this chat thing where later I can just show you on video because it's, the classroom's pretty big. All right, so now we need to add constraints. Again, a constraint is another file that we use to specify. So you click again, Add Sources, and here you select Add or Create Constraints. So here, Add or Create Constraints. Um, you add, you would create a file, and let's call it end, call it end demo uh, constraints. How about that? Click OK, and then you have the file here. The extension is XDC, but that's just some special format that uh, the company who makes Vivado and it's also the FPGA uses to specify the constraints. So, click finish, and then here you will see a new uh, file, okay? So this is where we are going to really physic, uh, in, in terms of in, inside the software, tie these outputs to the ports. So these are fixed uh, syntax. Uh, okay, I right, do you want to go this right now? Sorry, set property package pin. And um, the important thing right now, what I want you guys to learn is um, how do we identify these in individual input and output ports? So when you get the board, you're going you're gonna to see that these input and output pins, um, they have some uh, labels um, printed as beside them, okay? And uh, the ones that are in, these parent in the parentheses are um, there are IDs for these labels. So what I can see here, um, obviously you can, but I can't, so here it says V17 for the rightmost switch, and then V16 for the second rightmost switch, all right? And then the, the other one actually is not V15, but actually it's uh, W16. So there's no, it's, it would look a bit, appear a bit random, but you can find these mappings right on the board or you can find them in the corresponding data sheet. So I'm going to write first um, the mapping for A, and it's going to be right most one. It's going to be V17. So V17, and the syntax here is get ports A. So this simply means that uh, we're mapping the input A to the switch V17. All right? So make a copy here, and then we can map B to V16. That would be the switch right adjacent. Now, the output. Again, the output is the same. The output is X, I believe. Let's double check. Right, X. And I'm going to map it to one of the LEDs. I'm going to read it, read it, read it uh, off on the board. It says, actually, U16. So it's going to be U16, all right? 
Now, with these dialing files, um, there's some other uh, details, but essentially what you also want to write at the end is, I'm so sorry for this, I feel like I need to disable this. Uh, web protection, right? Uh, quit it, okay. Great choice. <laughs> okay, anyway, um, let's continue. So finally, there are some settings that you always have to write. Um, you can ignore the reason for now. Standard, IO standard, LVCMOS33. Uh, and this, the, and I'm going to just write it and I'll explain it. So essentially, this line um, tells uh, the FPGA controller to treat all of these three inputs and outputs as regular standard input. Okay, there are many, many, uh, many other types, but uh, we just use this type, which is LC, LVCM OS33. The 33, to give you some context, represents, I think, uh, uh, that the input and output, in terms of physical connections, are using 3.3 uh, voltage as you know, the, the, the peak. All right, so now that we have these constraint files set, we store them, and we're ready to start uh, synthesizing and implementing it. So let's run synthesis, and you can see the progress on the top right corner right here. It says running synthesis design, and it's taking some time. So this is where um, Vivado converts your hardware description of the circuit to the netlist, okay? All right, synthesis complete. And then uh, Vivado is actually smart enough to ask you, hey, do you want to do the following ones? Um, it would be run implementation, but let's do everything from the sidebar over here. So I click cancel. So I click, let's do run implementation over here, and hopefully uh, this demo would work. I'm more anxious than you are right now, actually. But, uh, let's see. Okay, so you can always look at the progress bar. When it stops, um, or whenever there's an error, there's going to be a pop-up telling you the error, and you can look at the corresponding debug error messages. We will not go through um, the, the typical error message you might encounter here, but uh, um, whenever you run uh, into these error messages, feel free to consult an assistant, and they would be able to help you out. All right, so um, this implementation process, um, they're running a lot of different things. I believe that this route design, they're really hooking up um, or programming uh, the circuit so that the, it really knows which CLBs to hook up with uh, the lookup tables. And now finally at the end, um, the implementation is complete and you can proceed to generate the bitstream. Now again, you can also find the command for generating a bitstream here at the final part. Okay, because the bitstream is the final product you want to send to the board, so it's at the program category. So if I click generate bitstream, it's going to generate um, the, the bitstream file. Okay, there's a lag here. Uh, but this is a really old laptop, so hopefully you will run into less of an issue when you install Vivado on your own laptop, and uh, it should run pretty well. It supports Windows and Linux, I believe. Okay. All right, so there's an error, and I believe I should look into the problem here. Okay. Uh, Put on my cheat sheet. There might be a typo in my uh, in my code. All 
All right, sorry. Um, there's an underscore in this set property over here. All right. Now, whenever I find an error and fix it, um, you can always click on the on the part where you where you met, where you got an error, and it's going to rerun whatever corresponding steps necessary in the previous steps. Okay, so hopefully this time it works. So as you can see, the error messages presented by Vado they are still a bit cryptic, and it takes some time to go through it. Could go through with it, but uh, hopefully uh, um, you will be able to identify the issues here and there and fix it accordingly. Um, if not, the system would would be able to help you there. Okay, we just have to wait for it to finish. But um, any other questions during this process when you fill this gap? Yeah. Yes. What exactly is the difference between synthesis and implementation? So um, I'm not sure about the specifics, but uh, the synthesis actually generates this netlist. Okay, so I haven't really introduced to you the net the concept of netlists just yet, but um, the implementation really converts <laughs> these netlists into uh, the actual uh, um, the actual design of the or the actual implementation of the circuits, and it is also in this part that they verify whether or not the constraints are satisfied. Um, you might wonder why I use the word constraints for these input and output bindings. Uh, constraint is actually there are actually two types of constraints in Verilog or at least in Vivado. Um, the first type is these I/O bindings. Uh, the second type. Uh, so the first type is these I/O bindings that binds your uh, input-output variables to the corresponding hardware port switches, here and there. The second type is a timing constraint where you specify uh, how long your circuit should run for a particular part. Okay, so there are two types of constraints, and it is also in these parts where, throughout the process implementation, that you that these constraints would be uh, valid uh, would be checked against your design to see if they if your design satisfies these constraints. For more details, um, there are also a lot of online resources for you to look into. I'm just trying to give you the really basic overview of how to get through the labs this way. Okay? Good. So thanks for the question. Um, and now we've done, we've, we've done this together. So um, let's cancel this again. And now the bitstream file has been generated. It says write bitstream complete. And you can expand the open hardware manager here and just click on open target, auto connect. And if your board is successfully connected to the, to the computer and also powered on, so please power it on, um, there is going to be this uh, thing saying that uh, you're going to see here uh, the, the board is, is found by Vado and it's connected and everything is all set. What you have to do is to click program device, okay? So just to make it still uniform, uh, to keep everything consistent, we can also click program device over here. And it's, there's going to be a small menu popped up here. And there's one selection just for this board, essentially. You click on it. And then here, you can program the device. So again, it's, going to be a, bit, it's a bit stream, right? And this is this bit file that I've been talking about. So uh, it's essentially a file. And by default, it's going to be right here. Don't put anything in debug files, because we haven't really talked about that just yet. Um, and we can just click program here, OK? All right, so programming the device, we're done. And I'm going to create a video call to myself. Uh, I'm not going to give you the link just yet. All right. OK, let's see. So 
Right. Oh, that's me there. All right. So what I'm going to do is change the camera direction, and you get to see yourself. Uh, I, enough? All right. Hi. Okay. Good. <laughs> right. That's a lot of really enthusiastic of you. Thanks. So um, I'm going to make it uh, rotatable right here. And all right. So this is the board. And remember I had... I mentioned that I would use this switch and the second switch. All right, so this switch and the second switch over here as the input, okay? And the upper part, this LED would light up whenever both uh, switches are on, okay? So let's do it like this. If one is turned on, nothing happens, but if both are turned on, uh, voila, you have your light. All right. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, you have no idea how nervous I was when I... Uh. Okay, so um, that's the idea. So now I have a working circuit here, and you can really change your settings. Like, for now, I, I flicked, I've turned off one of the switches, and uh, it doesn't light up anymore. So later on, uh, you will also see that uh, throughout the labs, you can modify other things, and feel free to be creative. Um, if we ask you to map a certain light to the left-most side, you know, you can also light it up to any other place. Uh, as long as functionally we know that you've gotten things right, you will get the points, okay? Like I said, we want you to walk away with four points. Okay, so that is essentially it. And um, next week, you will all get the boards, two, at a, two in a group, and uh, you should have fun with it. So, um, just to quickly conclude, in this lecture, we have talked about the, the following. A quick... Whoa. Okay, anyway, let's do this. So in this lecture, we have gone over a quick introduction of the FPGA. We've gone over a, a quick tutorial on the, on the FPGA programming, the one I just showed you. And as a matter of fact, you can find a lot of online resources to get started. And there are a lot of other much, much, much cooler demos uh, that you can find um, here, okay? And they even allow you to connect to remote monitors uh, and mouse and keyboards. We have gone over the overview of labs. They might change later on in the semester, but uh, ov overall, this should be what you, sh you, uh, you should expect. Okay? So for tomorrow, um, Frank is going to be here to talk about combinational circuits. Um, there might already be a lot of people thinking about what they are when I was, when I was mentioning them in class, but tomorrow you're going to figure out what they are. Okay? So, um, any questions before? We had the uh, lessons? Okay, you're all good. Then uh, please um, pay attention to the online resources and also our official website for announcements. And uh, have fun, guys. Thanks.